Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Som TV podcast. My name is Jason Wise. One of the uh, goals we had when we started Som TV was to create one of the best libraries of cooking shows anywhere in the world. And I am so proud to announce that the very beginning of that seed is finally, finally, finally come. We have a show live right now on Som TV called Cooking with Wine. It's been quite a long time in the making. And the host is uh, a brilliant woman by the name of Kate Hill. She is somebody who is very involved in a feature film I have coming called The Whole Animal about the history of meat dishes and how a lot of our food evolved into what it is today. I wanted to work with her again very badly. And so we reached out and she somehow agreed to do a show about cooking in the French countryside using wine for sauce and other things. Kate is on my show right now. I advise all of you, right the second this is over, go to somtv.com and watch Cooking with Wine. And I think it's the most beautiful cooking show I've ever seen. Kate, how are you? I am fine. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. This is great. Uh, <laughs> of course. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. I mean, unfortunately, I didn't get to direct and shoot this show because of COVID. So we had an, our South of France crew there shooting it. It was one of those funny things because who would have thought we were right in the middle of a pretty serious lockdown when you and I talked. And I just never expected we'd be able to do this. And then you had this fantastic crew that was just like an hour and a half, two hours away from where I live. They were able to move during lockdown because they're professionals. And the French government protects their professional artists. So we were able to put this together. And the most beautiful weather in an April I have ever seen in 30 years. Well, you know, it's a very hard thing to admit that someone else shoots better than I do. But this crew is, uh, they are just incredibly talented, really, really, really brilliant guys. The purpose of this show and obviously everybody needs to tune in to watch Cooking with One. The first two episodes are live. The next two are coming the following week. This is the beginning of a beautiful thing. I cannot wait to do more of these. But I want to talk about French cooking. Now, first, you're an American expat. So you grew up in the States. I want to get a little bit of your story so people... Because why are you qualified to talk about this venerated thing we call French cuisine? I'm not sure that... I'm qualified to talk about it, but I have opinions. And those opinions are based on a lot of years. I've lived here 30 years, and I've actually lived in this spot 30 years. I arrived in France and then just sort of settled very quickly in this southwestern corner. But my background was I grew up in a family of cooks, and my mother was Italian. My grandmother and my great-grandmother were cooks, professional cooks, because they cooked in their own communities for other people. My mother and father had restaurants, so I grew up washing dishes, peeling potatoes, making French fries in that machine where you push the potato down through the grid. And so I grew right. up around food. And more importantly, I grew up around people eating food and being together and entertaining because my parents were really bon vivants in that way. So that just came naturally to me. I didn't know anything differently. And as a young adult, I started to travel. I found that I could always make my way if I could cook food for somebody. So my early years, I did. I was a yacht chef. I cooked my way around Africa. I just sort of followed my nose to discover things. And years later, decided to buy a canal barge in Europe with a friend, and we would charter it and cruise on the French canals. And that was the beginning of my learning to cook with wine, among other things. Right, 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 right. Later on in the show, you and I are going to get into sort of what we affectionately call like the bullshit uh, myths of French cuisine and cooking. And can you describe to me just what is French cooking? I think there's a little bit of that that's either been lost or over glamorized or whatever. But when you hear French cuisine, what does that mean to you? Well, for me, the real eye opener was when I did arrive in France. I'd traveled through Europe earlier, but when I arrived in France by barge in the you know late 1980s, we travel very slowly, you know, five miles an hour down these these canals, and from the top of France to the bottom took many many weeks. And each region that you would go through, you know, a geographical region or a political region, was actually a culinary region. Foods changed, everything changed, house shapes, roofs, tiles, or slate changed, but food changed in very, very short distances. So, you know, within 25 to 100 kilometers, you would be eating different kinds of food or the charcuterie would be different. The spices would be different. The wines would be different. As you know, I mean, there's a million different wine areas in France, just like there's a million different, well, 400 odd kinds of cheeses. <laughs> What's interesting about French food is that you have this cohesive country that we label France or something's French, but actually it's made made up of many, many small pieces of a puzzle. So if you thought of a jigsaw puzzle, really, it's a very accurate way to think of the cuisine of France. And that was the biggest eye-opener, that as I traveled, I realized like, 
two days later, things would be different. And I had left behind something that I didn't maybe get enough of or a taste of. And I learned, though, that there was a common denominator to all this. And I'm not talking about restaurant food. I eat in restaurants for a living. I take people to fabulous three-star Michelin restaurants all over Europe. I've done this for years and I, I love that. But I'm really just talking about everyday food, what people really cook at home. It's what I love and what I do. And I found that the one common denominator through all this diversity of different styles or different things, different approaches, was the common denominator was the ingredients, the actual raw material that French food, French cooking is based on, is the most best, freshest, most delicious you can imagine because it's all grown right here. You're sitting in the middle. I'm sitting right now today in the middle of a very diverse farming area that grows everything from cabbages and cauliflower to apples and kiwis to wine grapes and eating grapes to nuts to fruit to wheat to corn to sunflower. It's amazing. Everything is grown in this this area that I live in, in the Latte Garonne department. And it's having the proximity of this amazing, fresh, perfectly picked food because it's not going to be shipped 5,000 miles across country. It's not going to be stored in cold storage. There's some of that supermarket level that does go on. But everyday people can go and buy food from their neighbors pretty much everywhere across France. And what doesn't get sold locally goes to Paris and even Parisians get our really good food. Yeah. Is it fair to say that when people think of French food, they're more thinking about what you get in Paris than they're thinking about, you know, the regional stuff? Or am I wrong in that? I think people think about French food as restaurant food. I like to encourage people to look beyond that. Restaurants, of course, serve a great role for us. And besides, you know, being entertained and being taken care of and fed, I love, who doesn't love that? But if you scratch a French chef, he's going to have a grandmother in the countryside somewhere. And he's <laughs> going to he's going to credit his grandmother or his aunties or you know, Michel Girard, who is one of France's still top reigning Michelin, three star Michelin chefs. He's had three Michelin stars for over 40 years in his Eugenie Le Bain restaurant. Wow. And he opened up one of the new little baby bistros that was called Le Ferme au Grieve. And it's a little rustic looking restaurant. There's nothing rustic about the food though. He engraved the names of his aunts and his grandmothers and the women in his family on the silver as an homage to where he learned to cook. Yeah. And that's what interested me. And that's what I did when I arrived as a young cook in my 30s, I went to these women, older women, which I am one of now. And I went into the farmer's markets and the indoor markets and the, asked them, how do you prepare this? I've never cooked a rabbit before. What do I do with it? What do I add to it? And it was those directly from kitchen to me. It's what infuses my cooking, I think, with an authenticity that I shouldn't be able to have because I'm American and I'm a foreigner. But it's something people are proud to share with you. And that's the French cooking that I think people should be looking at. Restaurants always take it up a notch. We say up a notch, but beyond and do things that leave the essential thing behind. And I'm more interested in what makes that quintessential dish. Why is a roast chicken so highly prized as like a fabulous French dish? And that's because of the chicken itself. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. A lot of chefs will say they're nothing without the ingredients. It's like casting a film. Yeah. You put the right actors in the movie, you know, 70% of the work is done or, you know, maybe 60. <laughs> you still need a good story. You still need a good script. And I think that that's the recipe. But I don't want to say we've lost in America because that's not really fair. But this primary source, this passing down, it's almost like retelling fairy tales. To be able to go to somebody and say... How do you do this? Where do you get it? And for somebody to say, you get it over there and that's a better place and then here's how you cook it and here's when you get your hands off the meal. Don't mess with it. Here's when you put your hands on. I find that there's a big difference between making something out of a cookbook and speaking to somebody and having them show you or talk to you or you just watch them and shut up. And there is a very different experience there because you don't have that handshake. You don't have that pass on. I think it's so important. The meals that you cook in this show, Cooking with Wine, they don't look like meals that you said, oh, here, I'm just going to give this a whirl. I can clearly see that A, you love these, but B, they were handed to you, handed down, and whoever handed it down to you took it from somebody else. It's clearly muscle memory watching you do this. And so I would like to see a return to that, but I wonder if we ever really had it in America the way that France has it. I don't know. 
I don't know either because I think that we were so removed from our ingredients unless you grew up in farm country and I didn't. So I didn't have that experience. You know, I, I do know people who grew up in the Midwest who grew up on farms. And their families had gardens. They had fresh hairy couvert, but yes. I never had that. I had grew up in Hawaii and we had fresh pineapple. And I can tell you I've never had a great pineapple since I've been in Hawaii. So <laughs> it's all about where something grown and what it makes it, the immediacy of it. Americans know if you want good corn on the cob, you have to snap it off the stalk and put it in the water or on the grill. It has to go that fast. We know that somehow, but everything else we let languish for weeks and months sometimes in cold storage before we get it or they're picked so unripe so that they can be shipped and not bruised. Here, Sometimes I go to the market. By the time I've carried home my peaches in a basket to the house, you know, an hour later, they're bruised. They're so ripe. They picked from the tree so ripe. So I don't know that we had it much. We certainly didn't have it in the 50s and 60s growing up. And as a young cook in the 70s, I w- even in California, I'd say I never had food that was as fresh. Mm-hmm. What Alice Waters did is raise everybody's awareness of that, but it was in a restaurant, not at home. Right, so right. you would go and pay to have a fabulous meal in a Chez Panisse or, a, you know, or one of the other California cuisine restaurants. But people didn't even try to duplicate it at home because they couldn't get those products yet. Yeah. Whereas in France, it's always been available. And if people have gotten lazy or they've gotten complicit about not pursuing the best, I live in cities, you go to the big supermarkets. Even here, you have to have a little bit more time to go to the markets or buy your food directly from somebody. I landed here in paradise, so I didn't move. I stayed because it was easier to get good food here. There's certainly something to be said about looking someone in the eye, giving them some cash and taking food from them, you know, every week. And then you look at their hands, you know, there's dirt encrusted. (laughs) I just remember this woman, one of the first vegetable farmers that I got to know and talk to. It was more in the Mediterranean area when I was on the Canal du Midi. And she was very cute and she had like a cute haircut and always wore nice clothes to the market. But she had her fingernails were just encrusted with dirt because she was the one picking the, the peppers and the tomatoes and all the things. It was her farm. She was picking it, bringing it to the market and selling it to me. And so I love those dirty fingernails. I love that because I knew she was doing that, all that hard work for me. Definitely. That's great. As I mentioned at the top, we have a film coming called The Whole Animal. Yes. It's a pretty serious passion project. It's very much like my second film, Into the Bottle, where it takes you all over the world. I think we filmed in seven countries for this film. I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out to be eight. I think you're the main character of it. I think. I want to say you're probably the main character of the film. It's finishing editing right now, but it's been a long time in process for a number of reasons, and I personally think it's a great film. But what I wanted to say is when we came to visit you, I watched you do something that I still really don't know how you did it, and it also appears so simple, which I think the greatest cooks and teachers do. You went to the market, you bought some, I believe it was copa, Mm -hmm. you bought part of the pig, Mm -hmm. copa is shoulder, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pig shoulder. The shoulder neck. You bought Mm -hmm. the uh, copa at the market from a butcher who's in the film, you went home, you cooked it with figs, you cooked it with armagnac. It was this meal that literally, I might as well have come to your house and been like, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you cook one of the three best meals I've ever had in my life with two hours notice? By the end of the day, I remember, you know, we filmed with you. I drank way too much rosé and I jumped <laughs> in the canal behind your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do that with all of my guests. So the men just open them up. But, well, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's funny because when you were talking just a little earlier, I realized that what works about the video and the movies and showing is just what you said. I learn best by watching. I like to read, but a recipe is only just sort of a a roadmap. You have to also know how to drive a car. You have to know what kind of gas to put in it. There's a lot of things, you know, besides just, you know, go from point A to B, which is what a recipe is. And I learned to cook here by watching people cook. And so in order to do it, to share and pass that on more than just to, you know, I do cooking classes here in person until recently. We did that a lot, but I'm only reaching a few dozen people a year. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we have an opportunity for somebody to watch. And I hope that they look with open eyes like you did and say, you know, what I did was very simple and probably just thrown together au pif, as we say, just, you know, kind of, yeah, a little of this, a little Armagnac always makes something taste good. Uh, Figs are in season, I'm going to use figs. But I know what puts together and is having the basic techniques and those great ingredients, how can you go wrong? And being able to show that and what I love about watching, even, you know, kind of cringe when you watch yourself on any videos, but I've been doing the cooking videos all winter is to show people 
And what I love is that Balkan and the film crew caught and focused on what I was doing too. So as I'm stirring and making this at my own with Sauterne wine, they filmed me stirring, whisking, whisking. They didn't cut it and then just go to the next thing. It was like, it takes time to show that. Mm -hmm. And I really, really appreciated that you guys got that. And I hope that people will learn from watching because I think that's the most valuable way. Because then you're really invested in it. You are learning, not I'm teaching you. Yeah, that's really true. I've just never seen a cooking show like this. It's an experience as much as it is a step-by-step. And honestly, I find it to be, I watched it. Now, I produced this thing, so I knew how it was cut. I knew what was going on. And yet when it was finished, I watched it. And then I wanted to rewatch it immediately again. And it wasn't because... I missed stuff or it was confusing. It was because it was such an amazing journey and I forgot that I wanted to learn how to cook, that I enjoyed my time with you and I enjoyed my time with the meal and the experience so much that I forgot, oh wait, how do I cook this again? Because in a normal cooking show, you're like, all right, at some point I want to cook whatever they're making. And in this one, I just sort of fell into the story of it. It's just very interesting the way it played out. And I think that's a real big testament to the way you teach and cook. Well, thank you. It's very story driven. Well, I am. I have my very first job and my first love in school and in life was storytelling. That's what I did for a living for the first seven or eight years after I left home and left school. And I was a puppeteer. A puppeteer. And so you, if you can control an auditorium of 600 kids with a sock on your hand, you know, you can teach somebody <laughs> how to cook. So even though it's been decades in the making, and in this way, I, I look at, I'm still playing with inanimate objects. It might be a whisk and some eggs. Right. I'm still sort of kind of, you know, trying to capture your attention and keep it. You know, the quieter you get, the more they listen. So I try not to shout at the camera. But I do feel that the story is what interests me always. I'm just writing the recipe, actually. I'm a little late getting this out for the second episode, which is the Cive de Sangrier and Escargot. And I sort of took some liberties. A cive is a wine-based dish, usually game, meat of game, cooked in wine. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's pretty simple, deceptively simple. I wanted to include the escargot in a way because I had been told a story about how the wild boar were destroying the stone walls, these dry stone walls that create the terraces or enclose the grape growing areas. And the escargot or the wild boar, excuse me, were looking for escargot to eat. That was why they did it. So I always had in this mind, that, you know, the re- Revenge of the escargot was to be combined, or the revenge of the winemaker was to create a dish that combined the wild boar and the escargot together. And so when I created that dish, it was sort of my invention based on a very classic thing. Right. But it was because it was all based on a story, and maybe the story was just in my head, but I, you know, I felt it was important to bring that forward. <laughs> so that dish, by the way, I was uh, Jackson, uh, producer and cinematographer I work with, we were watching that and we both decided that if, uh, when we're on death row, it's not if, it's just when we're on death row. That's the meal we want. No. <laughs> it is, uh, this is this is episode two of Cooking with Wine. It's wild boar over polenta, just slow cooked, like they took just three succulent days. and... <laughs> Oh my God, this meal. Yeah, well, see, so you would get a few extra days of reprieve if you ordered that because they would have to take the salt. <laughs> oh, good, that's right. You have to cook. You. <laughs> it's a cheater's that's way. That's a good technique. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. I'm getting the chair, but my, but I want your, I want your sangria <laughs> dish. So it takes three extra days. Let's transition into what I think people will find very fascinating. Uh, you ready to talk a little bit of bullshit in uh, yeah, the perception of French cooking? All right, let's do. I it. call it myth busting. Myth busting. Yes. Okay, I think someone has a trademark on that oh, term. Okay. But all right, well, no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So let's start with what is a perception or a thing that people think about French cooking that is just nonsense? Oh, well, everybody thinks French cooking is very rich, meaning it's fatty. It's got a lot of cream or sauces and and it can be, some dishes can be. But again, that's sort of highfalutin restaurant food. If you go to my neighbors, the farmers for lunch, they're not having that heavy, creamy, thick with sauces kind of food. They're eating mountains of vegetables. This should be number two, that the French don't eat vegetables. There'll be huge, at this time of year, big bowls full of haricot vert. And you'll eat more green beans than anybody ever can even imagine in one meal. And so this idea that French food is rich is based on people only ever had French food if they were going for like company dinner, if you went to somebody's house. So it would be fancier than what a French family would normally eat or restaurants and restaurants are always going to take it up a knot and add some more butter. And, you know, we don't even cook with butter down here. So I use butter and pastry. 
that's it. I don't cook with butter hardly at all. So I use duck fat, which is not rich at all. <laughs> but there's you use, a, you know, something light. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say that there's a misconception that you can't eat healthfully here. Yes, you can. You have to make good choices. That's all. Yeah. Well, you know, what's, I mean, what's the traditional diet? It's five cigarettes, two glasses of wine. <laughs> and, you know, I and, don't know uh, anybody that <laughs> smokes here. None of my French friends that smoke. I mean, maybe the kids do now, but I, none of my friends. The smoke. kids, I mean, they're probably all dead. So, yeah. So, yeah. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, so, so, okay. You, you mentioned that the French don't eat any vegetables. Obviously I have spent, well, I've spent, I think I've probably been to France like 30, 40 separate trips, maybe more. And I could totally agree with that. Vegetables, especially seasonally. I mean, there are times you'll go to Burgundy and it's the middle of winter and you are eating slow cooked meat all day long. Yeah. I will admit there are places where you're like, oh my God, a carrot, but it's been cooked for you know, for two days in the stew. But, yeah. <laughs> but there are situations where veggies are hard to find. But I will say you go to places like, you don't expect it, like Brittany, France, and you find enormous amounts of veggies when I traveled there. I, I was unexpected. I thought it was just the Mediterranean. No, no. And it is interesting. Like I actually, years ago when I moved to this area and I met a French family and they sort of adopted me, but on the way to becoming really good friends with them, lifelong friends, I found myself doing little things like just showing up at their door and knocking right before lunch. They would have invited me, but I wanted to see what they ate when they weren't inviting friends. If they invited me and my friends or people that were with me, they would always make a very you know, more elaborate dish. But if they were eating on their own, it was very different. And so that's when I discovered that the French did eat vegetables. Why would they serve you, you know, like caramelized turnips, these most beautiful little turnips you can ever imagine. So delicious, like a bowl. F they wouldn't serve those to you if you came for fancy dinner, but they would eat that for themselves. It would be one of the dishes they would eat, you know, with a little meat on the side or some leftover chicken from Sunday or, you know, the meat centric right. part is really for company. So if you want to know how the French eat, you have to be sneaky. <laughs> you got to just like break in the window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I <like> that. <laughs> I'm shameless. <laughs> when it comes to going into somebody's kitchen, I always remember, we were traveling with a boat. This is like in 20 years ago. And I decided to drive my barge back to Holland. I want to do one big trip. And it was about 18 months of traveling, going back all the way up north. And I remembered places from when I came down, as I was saying very early on. That was when I first learned about the different regions. And so we were traveling up north and I had a uh, two friends who were chefs on board with me, good cooks, my French friend, Beitou, and my good friend, Michael Huber, the cranky chef is how we dubbed him. And <laughs> we were pulled up at a lock in the Ardèche, in the northern part of France, on the Ardennes. And there was at the lock house, the woman who ran the lock's mechanism was cooking inside. And Michael wrote on a piece of paper, j'ai faim, I'm hungry, and went up to her window and just held it in front of her at her kitchen window. And to see what she was cooking, we were just trying to get in to see what a real person was cooking for lunch that day. And she was cooking wild mushrooms that she just harvested and shallots in a little wine sauce. And so that's going to be one of the dishes that I do next on Cooking with Wine. Oh, God almighty, I, I want to eat that right now. It's so delicious. It's so good. Oh, that sounds so good. All right, back to- Back to myth, but back to the bullshit. What else you got? I think there are dishes that people think of that everybody all over France eats that are, you know, they're the French dish, like French onion soup. But I don't think I could find a bowl of French onion soup anywhere in this part, hundreds of kilometers around me. People don't eat it here. It's not a thing. It's, I think, very specifically was from a certain period. It's certainly more Northern. You might find it more in Paris. There are soups based with onions and garlic. We have a garlic soup that is famous here. But that French onion soup with a melty cheese and the beef thing, and it's all salty and gooey. It's <laughs> just like, oh, I, it's really not. I've never had that ever in a restaurant here. They would serve it, it to people who come in, but it's, I don't think it's not a thing, really. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I can understand. I will say I'm a sucker for French onion soup. It's hard after having a bowl of that to get my wedding ring off and on because of, <laughs> yeah. of, of how salty it is. Yeah, that's... Because <laughs> of how that's, salty it is. But. That is something, too. Here's another Here's another little myth then. You know, French food is salty and garlicky. I always tell people, cut out that garlic stuff. You know, reduce the garlic. 
It's more restrained here. The chicken with 40 garlic cloves, that's an American thing. I'm sure it came from somewhere, but it's not... People use garlic here like a couple cloves, not a couple heads when they cook something. It's interesting. Here in this part of France, if I live in this part of Gascony, we would use shallots more than garlic. Garlic is used with some restraint. And so the idea that everybody smells like garlic is really wrong. Uh. Well, I you mean, smell like Chanel. Come on. If you go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have one last thing that's kind of in the realm of the kind of BS type French cooking thing? Oh, you can cheese. Get, you cover butter, salt. Cheese. Ah, cheese. Okay. Now, French cheeses are phenomenal. And again, very local into different areas. So you'll have Burgundian cheeses and Burgundy. You have Camembert and Normandy. You have Brie. You have all the different cheeses, the Alpine cheeses and all these different areas. But... Not everybody eats cheese after dinner, especially where I live in the southwest of France, because we eat foie gras, and foie gras is fat, like cheese is fat. And so you don't have the kind of rich mouthfeel. You don't need the cheese. You've had it in a different way in your meal. So most people don't eat cheese after their meal in this part of France. You can get all those cheeses from fromage, but it's kind of a special thing. Ah, Roger. I rarely serve cheese. If I serve a cheese after a dinner, it'll be one cheese from locally, from a goat's cheese maker that I know, or maybe a little from the Pyrenees, because that's the closest. We're not a dairy area. We don't have any cows in this area, really. So there's no cheese of this part of France. It's the cheese hole. Love it. So, okay, you're going to go to the electric chair. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> so now let's yep. talk about what meal you're going to have. Oh what's God. your, uh, it doesn't have to be French, but what's your meal you're going to take? And I mean, specific as possible. Oh, I want to hear well, the drink, whatever you're going to have with it. Well, food is memory. And like you say, muscle memory, it's your taste and sensation and smell and everything. And I think the meal I would have is from my grandmother, my Italian grandmother. And it would be that Italian-American red sauce, spaghetti sauce with meatballs that she cooked always very, very long, many hours and three kinds of meat. There was always Always meatballs and a uh, piece sausage. Of, no sausage. That's separate. She only used sausage if she was making polenta. Oh, My grandmother's family was from Abruzzo, from the Abruzzo. So very specific kind of cooking in that area in the mountains. But she would always put a pork chop. And she would put a piece of beef rolled up and there was something about that sauce. And it wasn't till I went to the town where her mother came from, a little tiny village called La Tomano Pello. I arrived there. I drove there by myself. I was coming through Italy. And I stopped. It was Sunday morning. Nobody was around. Everybody was in church. And I parked the car. I got out. And I smelled my grandmother's spaghetti sauce. You know, she didn't live there. She passed away many years before. But there was something there that was like, oh my God, this smells exactly like my grandmother's spaghetti sauce. And I followed my nose. I found a butcher shop that was open on Sunday morning. I walked in and there was a woman buying some meat and the butcher. And then when I looked in the butcher case, I saw pepperoni, hot spicy links, and I saw packages of hot pepper flakes because that's a symbol of a brute. So it's a chili pepper. I had no idea. And then it was like a ton of bricks. It hit me. I remembered then my grandmother putting those red pepper flakes in the sauce. It mm. wasn't enough to make it hot. It wasn't even enough to make it spicy, but there was something about the aroma that gave it that deepness. So when I realized... Like, wow, that sense of memory is so important, that sense of smell and taste. So I tried to recreate that because I knew I was, you know, I made spaghetti sauce for years. I thought I was doing a good job. Then I realized like, oh, I missed one of the ingredients. So it would have to be that spaghetti with meatballs and just like my grandmother made. I love it. What are you going to drink with that? Yeah, well, I would drink a bottle of the wine that's grown right here, the local wine, which I love. It's um, beyond Bordeaux when we're in this part of Gascony because it's the little appellations of Cote de Buzet or Madron or Cahors that people don't really know. But the Bordeaux grapes, Cabernets and the Merlots, but the Tana is one of the grapes and it's this sort of deep, fruity richness that goes with that kind of food, those tomato-based foods, and goes with the cooking here, goes with the duck and the Armagnac here. So I would have my Gascon Abruzzes 
last meal. Well, I'm sure there are several Italians gasping that you would not have a multiple Chiano, you know, (laughs) but but that's okay. We're going to be just fine. (laughs) I would eat that too. Hopefully I'll be on death row with you. Yeah. Hey, (laughs) you can cook the polenta wild boar meal for me and I can have some. Right. right. Maybe they'll make the, they'll give us a kitchen. That would be great. (laughs) Yeah. It'll be like in the scene in Goodfellas. I love it. All right. Well, this has been a pleasure. Really fast. Kate also does incredible cooking that's done virtually. Kate, where can people sign up and be a part of what you do? I, I, there's really nothing else like this. Well, I've been teaching online since last year for the first time, and it's been really fun to do and learn how to teach these things. And through my website, Kate Hill Cooks, Dot com And I have a teaching platform. Press that button and you'll go see what classes. There's a membership so you can just sign up for, you know, a month every month. And there is a video every week and then a live class once a month and an ebook every month that comes out with a seasonal sort of a culling of all the seasonal recipes, all the Septembers we're going through right now of all the things I've cooked with wine over all the Septembers that I've been in France. So pulling this together. Oh, man. And that's referred to as the Gascon year. And that is what I'm really focusing in all these videos capturing what the seasons are like, not just the seasons in a broad way, but this like month by month, what are we eating now? It's tomatoes, it's melons, it'll be figs next month. It's the, when do we shift to the slow cooking and braising? When do we give up the grilling? So I've been documenting that in all these videos and sharing them with people. It's been really great. We really had a good time doing it and gave me rehearsal for cooking with wine. Yeah, well, it shows you were ready. KateHillCooks.com. Yes. Go there and subscribe to that. But also don't forget to subscribe to Som TV. If you're not a subscriber, I don't know why. It's 50 bucks for the entire year, $49.99. That's at SomTV.com, every streaming device. We're pouring our hearts out there for you guys. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's not even a bottle of wine. I know. Look, I, I know. <laughs> or trust taste me. of wine here. <laughs> Yeah, right. That's right. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. It really means a lot. Everybody, please be safe and uh, buy your ingredients local. Yes. It's a good idea to meet the person who makes it. Kate will tell you that. Shopping is cooking. Absolutely. Shopping is cooking. All right. Be safe, everyone. We'll see you next time.